You're very welcome to the Irish Political Roundup with me, Roisin de Cleric. And me, Paul Brophy. Roisin, could you tell our, our viewers and our listeners uh, what we have coming up in this episode? Well, Paul, as you know, during my former role as a producer and presenter on my Woman to Woman show on local radio, I covered many issues on and the topics relating to women and children. I tried for many years to get guests and potential guests to discuss and talk about the topic of this interview tonight, and that is child trafficking. No one would even say the word child trafficking, never mind discuss the topic or the issues relating to child trafficking. So many other issues here in Ireland. You know, we turn a blind eye, we sweep things under the carpet and just hope that they go away. Child trafficking is in every city, town and village, in every county here in Ireland, in some shape or form. Child trafficking is a $150 billion industry worldwide, run by highly organized criminal gangs preying on young girls and boys, abducting or grooming children for sexual exploitation, for sexual predators targeting children for their sexual pleasures. It's disgusting, immoral, barbaric, I know. But the harsh reality, Paul, it is happening right now somewhere to some little child or teenager as you, as our listeners watch or listen to this video. Mm. Ireland has been on America's watch list at tier two level for many years, yet there's no media, political coverage or outcry. We, as the general public, must ask ourselves why. Child trafficking is more lucrative industry than the weapons or drugs trade, yet there's absolute silence. The movie Sound of Freedom was released on the 4th of July last year in America, distributed by Angel Studios. Later this month, at the end of August, beginning of September, the movie Sound of Freedom will be in cinemas here in Ireland. Aim to Peter Taboon is the only politician to date, now it sounds to be corrected on this one, who has mentioned child trafficking in the Doyle. Our very own T-shirt, Leo Varadkar, has publicly stated, whilst in New York, in America, who put us on the watch list, when questioned by reporters about child trafficking in Ireland, said, I quote, it's not a particular issue for us in Ireland, as it is, as our seas are so vast that people can't get onto small boats. Yet a few weeks ago, Paul, as you know, UCD published a report calling for urgent investigation on detailed cases of young girls taken from residential care homes by taxis, brought to hotels for child trafficking exploitation, again organized by criminal groups for sexual pre uh, predators targeting children. Maybe when the Sound of, Mo uh, freedom, the Sound of Freedom is released here in Ireland, Child trafficking will get the general public talking. The media has started talking about it. And hopefully in September, when the politicians come back to the Doyle uh, after the Doyle rec recess for the holidays, might start asking why has it taken so long to highlight this issue? For this episode of the Irish Political Roundup, we aim to start the conversation of child trafficking here in Ireland, defining what child trafficking is and really getting, you know, to what is child trafficking? You know, what are the signs and symptoms and how do we help or how do even the young children help um, and ask for help? To discuss uh, these issues uh, surrounding child trafficking, we are joined by JP O'Sullivan, Communications Ma uh, Manager with MECPAS, and Anne Mara, Educational Manager with MECPAS, and Bernie Smith, CEO of Kerry Youth Service. JP, Anne and Bernie, you are very, very welcome to the Irish Political Roundup. Thanks, Roisin. Paul, um, you and I have spoken recently mm. and you were shocked at even that there was child trafficking here yeah, in Ireland. Absolutely. I'm I'm a kind of this is a great program for, for myself. It's a great opportunity to learn more about uh this subject, which unfortunately it is it is happening and um I suppose it's it's important that we we, we shine a light light in that. Um, uh, J J P and you're both from um uh, Metpat. Uh, before we get into kind of nitty gritties of um of the of the interview and, and the subject matter, could you just give our listeners a kind of a brief 
our listeners and viewers, sorry, a brief kind of outline of uh, what exactly MetPats do and, and kind of um, what exactly is the body of work that you're, you're uh, interested in? Sure. Um, so MetPats was founded back in 2013. So we're celebrating 10 years of our existence this year. Um, we're the only organization in Ireland working in direct partnership with frontline and emerging professionals to help prevent child trafficking and to enhance existing um, protective measures. So when we were founded back in 2013, the focus of the work was very much on the hospitality industry. So responding to the needs, I suppose, that were identified at the time, training hotel staff and management to be competent in identifying potential victims of trafficking and responding, so supporting them to develop reporting protocols. Now, I suppose in the, the course of our lifespan to date, um, we've extended outwardly um, to other services, um, I suppose responding to calls and needs um, as they emerge. So we work with security personnel, we work with the Private Security Authority of Ireland, training their, um, their staff. We work with social workers all over the country. And um, we have a partnership with TUSLA, and we've been working with them for the past 12 months education their frontline practitioners. So to date, we've educated 500 of those social workers right. with plans in the pipeline in for the autumn um, to begin with an additional cohort. We work with healthcare personnel. So we work with um, frontline healthcare personnel meeting with potential victims of trafficking through a &E departments. We work with all the universities in Ireland, educating emerging professionals in social work masters, um, social policy masters and their law students, human rights law students. And we have a partnership with the US border control at Dublin airport as well. Um, again, in the autumn, hoping to roll out pieces of training to their frontline staff. So the work is varied, um, but we're very fortunate in our partnerships. We believe fully in collaboration. Um, we believe that you know the, the responses to the issue of trafficking need to be joined up and people should not, or organizations, can't exist in silos in their attempts to, to respond to the issue. So we have some great partners out in the community, including KDYS. Um, we work with a number of agencies around the country because it's not just a Dublin centric issue. It's not yeah, a capital absolutely. city issue. It's not a city centric issue. It's as rushing to happening in every town, village um, and city around the country. So in a nutshell, that's what we do or what we aim to do anyway. Yeah, it's a it's a human rights issue if we were to um, kind of nail, nail it down. Absolutely. And, and what, as regards your role within MetPat, you're, I, I take it you're kind of delivering a lot of the, the training kind of, uh, with all these various different, um, uh, partners and, uh, uh, prof professionals. Um, what are some of the signs that you, um, teach, um, anybody on your, your training to look out for as regards to uh, child trafficking? Well, thank you, first of all, for giving us the opportunity to speak about this issue um, this evening. Um, some of the, there, there are lists and lists of indicators when it comes to child trafficking, and it's important to step back a little bit and look at what child trafficking is. And yeah. I think there are many misconceptions around that, and um, maybe people, if they do know about child trafficking, they would know specifically around trafficking for sexual exploitation. But the fact of the matter is that there are many different types of child trafficking, including child sexual exploitation, but also child criminal exploitation, domestic servitude, trafficking for forced labor, trafficking for organ harvesting, amongst other types. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we're talking about a whole range of exploitations that children are being trafficked for. Yeah, it's horrific. Indeed. It's it's it is horrific, and it's a it's a, a very very um, broad um, spectrum. Yeah, you want wanted to come in there, Roshin, did you? No, I was just going to say, Bernie, uh, you are the CEO of the Kerry um, Youth Service. Can, can you tell us what your role is and what you do? Well, I suppose I have been interested in this topic for a, a number of years, maybe 20 years now, no more than yourself. Um, and I started out, I suppose my first exposure to the issue was when I worked with unaccompanied asylum seeking young people in Ireland. Um, 
And very quickly, as I moved into different youth work contexts, realized that the issue was much broader than our general stereotype in Ireland. Um, so I suppose that's where it began from. And even at that point, when I was working with unaccompanied asylum seeking young people, there seemed to be huge confusion as to who would be responsible for the response. You know, was it a criminal issue and the responsibility of the guards? Was it a child protection issue and the responsibility of TUSA? And then, of course, with unaccompanied uh, asylum seeking children, you had the refugee law angle as well. And that whole situation is probably nearly as enmeshed now today as it was 20 years ago. However, I've worked in so many different contexts um, in youth work, in urban situations, in rural situations, across socioeconomic groups. And yes, there are particular risk factors, but the, you know, the, there are no children that are completely immune to the risk of trafficking. And, and again, those misconceptions are it's so important that people um, are open to hearing the definition. Um, mm. And you know, the work that JP and Anne are doing to debunk the myths about trafficking, it is really so important that the frontline services and the statutory agencies engage with the training and take responsibility to understand the issue themselves. So currently I'm the CEO of KDYS. Uh, we're a large youth organization. We cover uh, the county, the, well, the diocese of Kerry, in fact, um, we have about 75 staff. The vast majority of them are working in various different programs supporting young people in the community. Um, and I suppose one thing that became very apparent when our staff did the training was that all of the youth workers had been exposed to various different contexts in which young people were being exploited. Um, but weren't necessarily recognizing it as trafficking. And, you know, I, I sat in on the two days of, set of training provided by Anne and JP, and you could just see the lights going off all over the room where people saying, oh my God, yes. Because of course there's multiple risk factors there. So if you're working mm -hmm. with a young person who is at risk or a young person whose behavior is out of the norm, if you, have, if you are looking at it from a child trafficking lens, at least you are open to the possibility. You know, and I suppose within all youth services, we work with young people who are in the care of the state, who are involved in the criminal justice system or in projects diverting young people from crime or young people who have particular risk factors. Um, I suppose, again, there would be a lot of attention currently on um, you know, young people who come from impoverished backgrounds. And again, that's a risk factor, um, but yeah. it's not the only factor to be considered. You, you, you know, there, there are multiple, multiple reasons why young people might be at risk of trafficking. And that leads on to my next question, you know, is what, you know, what children, you said, you know, is it people, children from, you know, challenged backgrounds, from homelessness? You know, is that where the, the area, the, the target, or is it any ch children that is really open to be targeted? I think, Roisin, when we talk about potential victims of child trafficking, we're talking about anybody under the age of 18. Um, we're talking about anybody with a vulnerability um, that can be observed and exploited. Um, so we're talking about children who may be experiencing homelessness, children who come from homes where domestic violence is present, um, children from minority groups, um, children with access to the internet. Um, we're talking about anybody that displays a vulnerability is a potential victim of trafficking. But the Department of Justice and the International Organization for Migration run a campaign every October, and it's called Anyone Trafficked, and they have a very good resource website. Um, but within that campaign, it details that anybody can be a victim of trafficking and anybody too can be a trafficker. Yeah. Sorry, Paul. Yeah, that, 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 that's a um, uh, very interesting point, uh, uh, JP. And as Roisin kind of alluded to in our, in her, um, in her uh, introduction there, it's trafficking as a whole, child trafficking as a whole, it's like it's a hundred and fifty billion dollar industry worldwide, so it's it's extremely lucrative, and um, you know, 
it's um as as I said, it comes it come it comes in, in ma many forms. So no no country unfortunately is Im Im immune from this. But how are we as how is Ireland, you know, doing? Are are we do we have the proper kind of uh prior protections in place to kind of to reduce this? Um, I might take that question. Yeah. Um, the response by the state so so far um, has has been lacking significantly. Um, the The crime of human trafficking was made a criminal activity back in two thousand and eight, um, and yet the country only secured its first prosecution for human trafficking um, the summer before last. Wow. So, uh, as well as the prosecutions being challenged for this particular crime, our identification is uh, severely lacking, especially when it comes to child victims of trafficking. Mm -hmm. So that means that we are simply not screening or not looking for potential victims of trafficking because frontline professionals don't necessarily have that lens through which to look at mm -hmm. Uh, potential risks that, um, presenting in children that they work with or come across. And so if we're to compare, for example, um, our nearest neighbours um, in the UK, they identify thousands of children every single year as victims of child trafficking. The majority of those children are British nationals and they are being trafficked for the purpose of criminal exploitation and sexual exploitation thousands every year and when it comes to our own statistics the department of justice um recently revealed with information from Mangartha Shiakona that on three consecutive years for so for the last three years they have formally identified only five children as victims of trafficking oh. and we know that that's simply not representative of the reality that is on the ground and especially when you read the likes of that research project that came out of UCD most recently around groups of men targeting children who are in residential care or in emergency placements under the care of the state and these children are being targeted and groomed and trafficked for sexual exploitation. And yet, Anne, you know, I was talking to JP, you know, a couple of times, and Ireland has been on America's, um, let me get this right, America's trafficking in persons list for years. And yet, only five prosecutions. Um, no, only uh, two prosecutions to date. Two, uh, only two. two. Yes. Oh, sorry, uh, thank yeah, two, but five children identified in the last three years. Yeah. So um, the US State Department looks at every country all over the world and ranks them in terms of their responsiveness. So Ireland um, is part of that um, survey and it has been on a critical watch list for two consecutive years, meaning that it is severely lacking in terms of how it's responding to the issue of youth human trafficking. We were elevated last year um, up a level to tier two, but it's certainly not where we should be. And certainly our counterparts in Europe would be um, a tier above us in terms of what they're doing to respond. So I think a lot of this is around um, um, uh, uh, almost like not an inability to, to, to open up the can of worms or to speak about it, but there is a real hesitancy around um, speaking about this issue. The fact that that report comes out every single July fairly makes the, the, the media. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if you ask Joe Soap on the road um, what our current ranking is in terms of our responsiveness to human trafficking, you're sure nobody would have a clue. And mm -hmm. if you were to ask anybody about human trafficking, the, the common... Um, um, the common understanding is, like Bernie said at the beginning, it's all about people being moved from other countries into Ireland for the purpose of some type of exploitation. And that is not the whole picture. It absolutely affects those people, but it also can impact Irish nationals and EU nationals living in this country. 
And that is really as well highlights what the UCG report recently when they came out. Can you tell us about the UCG report? Because, you know, I'm, I'm astounded that, you know, that children in residential care has been trafficked and taxied from residential care and B&Bs to hotels for sexual exploitation. And I, you know, and when you think about it, there's a lot of people involved in this. There is the taxi drivers, there is the hotel staff, you know, and Paul and I, were, we, we we had uh, brunch one Sunday a couple mm -hmm. of weeks ago with someone, and they were telling us that, that there's actually people, he works in Dublin at a residential care, and they're telling people not to get in the car, don't go. And, you know, but tell us about that UCD report, because it's very, very unsettling. I think the, the UCD report, Roisin, spoke very much to maybe what we've been hearing Anecdotally, for, for quite a long time, um, it details specific examples of children, as you mentioned, being targeted in within residential care. Again, that vulnerability being identified and being moved out of residential care for the purpose of exploitation. Now, when they're moved out, they are returning back to residential care, but they're out for that prolonged period of exploitation. To put into maybe a a clear example or, or case that was well publicized back in 2021 and um, that speaks to the, the contents of the report. Um, we saw a case of a 15 year old girl who was recruited out of residential care for the purpose of sexual exploitation in Dublin. She was moved around an extensive hotel network um, by a group of men. She was given drugs and alcohol and it was only when she was so brutally physically assaulted and raped that she came to the attention of a caregiver in a medical setting. But why the case stands out particularly for me, um, Roisin and Paul, is how it was reported upon in the media. So the, the headline in the Times and the Independent at the same time in the day was 15 year old girl poked off her head in Dublin Hotel. So we had missed the victimhood, we had missed the trafficking, we had missed the exploitation, but the media instead chose to focus on the behaviors that that child was presenting. She had been given drugs and alcohol um, for, in exchange for the exploitation. Um, there was uproar at the time about the reporting of it and rightly so, um, but I think what it spoke to is what Bernie and Anne have already said, You know, the, the wider understanding of the issue of trafficking is not there. And I think within the UCD report, it's a, it's a really strong piece of research and it certainly speaks to the public in terms of framing what is happening out there. Um, but it is something that's been going on for, for a very, very, very long time. Um, and it was unfortunate, I think, that the report landed um, on the morning of mm. the same day that the RTE news mm. broke about Ryan Tuberty. And the report seemed to have been hidden within reporting and within press. So it's great to have opportunities like this to, to maybe revisit that report um, yeah. and to, to speak to it. And I was and, just, and, yeah, sorry, Bernie. I was just going to comment on, um, you, you know, just to add what to what JP has said there in terms of that exploitation of young people and our understanding of what grooming actually is for that young person. So, again, yeah. some of the challenges in addressing the issue is that the young person is often unaware of the exploitative factor. You know, they may be gaining financially, they may be gaining emotionally, there may be a, a, an elevation in their status, in their peer group, in their community. It's very complex. Um, and also to challenge that thinking with a, young, a vulnerable young person, unless you're sure that you can offer appropriate supports. You know, it's mm. a very, very complex area. Um, and again, sometimes the... Um, the age of the young person is a factor. So I suppose at what point is their criminal responsibility assigned to the young person who's being exploited? I think we've got a lot of work to do there. Um, again, going back to the youth, uh, organ the youth work sector, uh, the vast majority of youth organizations work with young people up to the age of 24, up to the age of 30 for vulnerable young people um, right. on occasion. 
And again, this notion that at 18, suddenly somebody is completely responsible for themselves. So there's a secondary group here, I think, who, you know, when we talk about care, they talk about young people aging out. Um, and, you know, 18 to 24 is a particularly vulnerable time of life for young people who are already traumatized, who are already vulnerable. And again, there's a falling off of supports. So I think it's it's a much broader context. Um, and I think, of course, obviously, we start with the children. We start with early intervention, prevention, the identification, and then the appropriate responses. But we also have to think about that cohort. And I think in terms of criminal activity and criminal exploitation, if young people are involved in criminal activity at 18 to 24, one there most vulnerable, they're also most prolific. So in terms of what it's costing the state, if they could invest earlier to prevent that happening in the first yeah. place, you know, there'd be a lot more to be gained from that situation. Well, it's a very grey area then, Bernie, between, because we were talking on the phone earlier, and JP and Anne, it, it must be then for, for everybody, but especially for you guys, a grey area be between, is it a criminal act or is it a child protection act? Uh, which uh, government department between the, uh, the the Department of Justice and the Department of Children? Yeah, well, I suppose there's always um, a balance between, uh, you, you know, it comes to children, there's always a balance between rights and responsibilities, because I'm not saying that, that you, you let people off with serious crimes and that kind of thing. But if you're talking about young people who've been exploited from a very early age into criminal activity, and they're now servicing, for example, a, a really high drug debt. And they do that by selling drugs themselves and they're coerced mm. into that situation. When they turn 18, they don't suddenly, um, you know, then we can't suddenly hold them account to that. You know, and again, I suppose there's a whole thing around community capacity and we, uh, we get calls from parents, JP and Anne deal with parents were saying, would, would people please help us? We're trying, you know, no more than the residential care workers, we're trying to prevent our children from going out there. And equally, I think with the housing issue, you know, we've seen the information in the media recently around the sex, um, the sex for rent and the push to bring in the legislation around that. You know, again, I've worked with young people who are trying to finance a college education being dragged into that type of activity or trying to find money to feed their kids, their, their younger siblings who are still in home. So, you know, I think the financial situation that some people find themselves in is also a significant factor. So if we're talking about legislation, we also have to talk about what we're doing to support communities to create and increase safety for their young people and, and to resource community organizations on the ground, who those communities trust because I think this is the other thing. Yes, there's a role for the police. Yes, there's the role for Tusla. Obviously, that's essential. But resourcing services that families and young people trust, who they can turn to and actually tell, tell exactly what's going on, that, that's probably our first level of prevention, if you like. Um, because the people on the ground are the people who are identifying it far quicker than the state agencies that mm. usually people who are coming from generations of abuse uh, have lost all faith in those state agencies, you know, because the victims of those state agencies failing them themselves. Mm. And I think, Bernie, you make a very valid point there, you know, the state identification piece versus the community identification. And I think usually when the state begins to identify that's when a child or a young person is at crisis point yeah rather than get that early piece um we meet with organizations like yourselves bernie and you are meeting with those young people out in the community and i think a piece that needs to be explored here in ireland is aside from the the identification piece is the self-identification piece an education tool for young people to see themselves within worlds of exploitation um, even in the course of our work, you know, when we do our, our workshops or trainings, all of the, the, the voices that we're using within those are either from the UK or they have an American accent on them. Yeah. Yeah. We really lack that Irish centric piece of awareness um, here and look, hopefully over, over the coming years, we'd be able to develop something like that. Um, but you're right, Bernie, it's about early intervention rather than sitting, I guess, maybe crying over spilled milk. Yeah. 
don't yeah, build and up of people. It's, it's complementary. It's not either or, is it? But you know, at the moment, there's a, um, it's very disjointed. The whole the whole response. Um, and the strengthening of the legislation and that yeah. national referral mechanism that, that I'm sure you'll speak about in a minute, you know, that should bring greater coordination from a statutory point of view, but that must be backed up by adequate resources on the ground. Yeah. Absolutely. And you probably kind of alluded to some of this uh, in your exchanges there, the level of aftercare for victims of tri of uh, child trafficking in Ireland, um, is is it adequate? Um, or um, I've, I'm sure in Metpass you've you've worked with uh, victims of of child trafficking, and you know, and I'm sure there are you know young people that have thankfully uh, come out the other side. Um, well, MECPATH's just um, to, to make the point, it's not a frontline service provider. So we do not work right. with child victims of trafficking. What we do okay. is, is purely education of frontline professionals and emerging professionals. But in terms of the aftercare, the response um, has always been that if a child is identified, and I um, emphasize that word if, because like I spoke about this um, earlier, and the identification piece is is really lacking. But if a child is identified, they are taken into the care of Tusla and provided a safe place. And that's about as far as it goes. So they they have access to education, um, free legal aid. But if they're placed with a foster carer um, or in a residential home, um, many times those foster carers wouldn't have any understanding mm. of the exploitation that yeah, those yeah. children have suffered um, simply because it's just not on the ra their radar. And, and so um, th that's how it stands at the moment. Um, and after the legislation is passed, hopefully in the near future, um, you know, maybe there will be more, we hope there are more supports in place for children who are identified, but that unfortunately remains to be seen. So really what you're saying is like, once the the children who, who have been through child trafficking and that horrific life experience, their self esteem, their self worth, their self their, their self identity, and as who they even are in the world that they live in, is very challenged. They probably go into the hands of Trusler, and really that real that very sensitive aftercare that they need might not be there we don't I don't know but it might the specific aftercare that is very much needed to know that they are enough and they're loved and that child and that sexual exploitation they, that you know that it was wrong and it was criminal and and to help them heal mentally emotionally and physically as well well, yeah. I suppose that, the fact that Tusla has commissioned this training with MECPATHs is a great first step because it does mean that their staff um, across the board are um, becoming more aware, more attuned to this issue. But I suppose Tusla is struggling at the moment. Um, and again, the report by UCD identifying that young people in care are being specifically targeted um, you know, this comes at a time where retention of staff is an issue, recruitment of staff is an issue, um, the housing crisis is having an impact on Tusla being able to provide appropriate, safe accommodation for children. So children are going missing in care. And again, yeah. linked to this issue. Um, so there's a lot of factors contributing to the situation being quite pressurized at the minute. You know, and at various different organizations, IRAC, the Children's Rights Alliance, the Child Law Reporting Project have all been highlighting the need for additional resources for the state agency to adequately respond to support children who've been identified, but also to prevent the children in their care from being further targeted. You know, and it's it's shocking to see reports where children are in care are going missing. You know, we've seen it periodically over the years. Um, and to see it now at this heightened state again is very, very concerning. And mm. so therefore they could just get really lost in the system as well. Yeah. Really going into residential care and just like going into foster care and just 
really without that real su specialized support and aftercare that is needed for any child or teenager going through this sexual exploitation or criminal, but we'll concentrate on the sexual for this, but that, that specific aftercare, is that needs to be really put in place mm -hmm. so they don't disappear, don't get lost in the system, and maybe, too, which is critical, they don't be drawn back into it. Yeah, well, the, the, the UCD report pointed to the high turnover of staff. So again, for a child to trust who has gone yeah. through any kind of trauma, they need to establish relationships that are sustainable, that they can rely on, all of these things, that if you've got a high turnover of staff with the best will in the world, almost impossible. Sorry, Anne, I interrupted you there. Well, I was just going to say, I think a crucial you're frozen there, Anne. Is, is it just Anne, me? No. Out of the can you hear me? We yes. can hear you now, Anne. Yeah. Do you want to start again Sorry. on that? Yes. I was going to just say um, a crucial point to note um, in this conversation is that the children who have been trafficked for some type of exploitation often don't realize that they are a victim of a crime. They don't realize the extent to which they have been harmed. So if you look at children who have been trafficked for sexual exploitation or even criminal exploitation, they don't um, often don't self-identify as a victim at all. And so it's really complex in terms of our response to these children who might not see themselves as victims in any way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it does make them vul vulnerable to being re-trafficked, to, be, to being exploited further and in different ways. Um, so I, I think um, it's just important to, to point that out, that a child who has been trafficked may never understand mm. it as a harmful, um, exploitative thing that has happened to them. What about then, I will ask about the children that do realise that and have been trafficked and they realize young children that realize that they that this is wrong that you know this is and maybe trafficked and and used and abused several times a day knowing that it's wrong you know they're the children that do know that it's wrong you know the adults are supposed to look after them and protect them and and, and protect them you know they from a youth work perspective, um, maybe I'll chip in here or having worked yeah. with families whose children have been taken into care because they can't protect them. I think, again, it's very complex because children want to trust the adults around them. And you can have very complex relationships where, they're, where they are loved by these people and abused in equal measure. So, again, you know, for children to have the adequate supports, to have the therapeutic interventions, at a time that works for them, this is the other thing that you can't have, you know, I think particularly for if we to go back to asylum seeking children who disclose abuse and disclose it during the course of their application for refugee status, they are forced to disclose when it is contrary to their mental health, you know, that may, may not be the right time at all for them to be reflecting on what's happened to them, but, but that's what they have to do as part of that process which is a further abuse I suppose but again you know ensuring that there's adequate adequate therapeutic supports for young people it can be hard to get them and I suppose it brings up another issue which is the state of our youth mental health system currently in this country so we also have young people who are in need of services who are a vulnerable group who are at risk of exploitation who may have pre-existing mental health concerns and we don't have appropriate youth mental health responses it's very tricky <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, and another question is, is too is the fact that you know we're talking about the the teenagers in residential care there's also children that are being trafficked from country to country as well and you talked about you're working with the airports you're working with the ports you're working and two is about how how the airplanes have been told you know you see lots of programs where airplanes uh, are, are sort of trained now to actually 
be aware of potential uh, child trafficking to airports. And um, so how would anyone identify if someone was traveling, like we would go on holidays, identify that a child was, was possibly being trafficked into the country, and then at airports, coming through the airports, you're saying that you, you work with Dublin Airport because children are trafficked from country to country as well. Mm -hmm. So in terms of indicators, Roisin, um, we do have a comprehensive, I guess, guide for, for anybody, any of your, your viewers that are interested, they can go to macpots.com and on the, the homepage of the, the website, there's a booklet there for download that details all of the indicators but what it really comes down to, I think, when we're talking about frontline staff in those environments is perhaps noticing something that looks out of order or out of place, um, observing. And we're, I suppose, in all the training that we, we provide, we are very clear when we advise staff and management that it's not their place to investigate. It's to use their suspicions or take their suspicions to an authority, an investigating authority. Um, but to share one example, I guess, of maybe when training does work well um, within the airline industry was a, a young girl and her father flying from one side of a country to the other. It was the US. Um, they were being served by the in-flight team. Um, and one of the, the team members had opportunity to observe them for the few hours that they were on board. And she'd offered them a beverage and the father had said they'd both like water. Um, when dinner time came, they both wanted the chicken and the final round of drinks was both wanted water again. But what the member of cabin crew observed was that the, the girl in the company of her father was not making any eye contact. Her eyes were per permanently on the floor. She was dressed very differently to her father. He was quite well dressed. Um, her clothes weren't as maybe high end or labeled as, as the dad's. Um, but she had a feeling in the pit of her stomach that something wasn't right. So before the, the flight landed, um, she asked if they both needed to use the bathroom. The father said they did. She ushered them to the back of the plane and advised them that the queue was too big and that she was going to open the staff bathrooms for them. So she opened the toilet. The girl went inside, came back out. The member of cabin crew said, you know, I'll refresh the bathroom for you. And so she stepped in, but she'd left a pencil with a piece of paper in there. And on the piece of paper was help me was written on it. The girl had written. So she came back out, the father used the, the toilet, they took their seats. She, she alerted the pilot who alerted the ground crew, who alerted the authorities. So they boarded the flight when it landed and it transpired that the girl was being trafficked across that country for the purpose of sexual exploitation. She was no blood relation to the man um, whose company she was in. Um, but it was, I suppose it was down to that member of cabin crew who had at one stage done a piece of training, had remembered something and had the feeling in the pit of her stomach that something was out of place. And that's what I suppose we, we rely on in the delivery of our education pieces as well. Like we're not asking anybody to be burdened with the issue of trafficking every day in their practice, that they're not going around with a magnifying glass trying to find all these victims of trafficking. It's a piece of education that supports or equips the individual to be more aware um, and to be able to, I suppose, couple the awareness with the indicators, with that feeling that we all have that of the stomach feeling. And you, you think about it, you know, on social media, you see so many children every week, sometimes on a daily basis, going missing here in Ireland. And you're often wondering, you know, are they, are they just had, did they have an argument with their family? They thought, oh, you know, I'm off, you know, or did they, have they been either abducted or coerced to go away somewhere to be used for um, child trafficking. And, you know, how many people in Ireland would go missing, do you know, on a weekly or yearly basis? Um, I'm going to be honest with you, Roshan. I don't know. I did recently have my attention drawn to the missing persons website um, because I was doing something very, very boring. I was sitting in a queue at the barber's and I realized that they had an entirely dedicated screen in the Barbers of the Grafton Barbers. And I've since realized they do actually do a campaign, but it was pictures of missing people scrolling. The majority were children. Um, and in the course of, I suppose, waiting for my turn, I went on the website and I had a look and there are huge numbers of missing children in the country. 
not that we're I suppose made aware of them I think at one stage you know and this is showing my age when we think back to maybe the 80s and the 90s if there was a child missing they were on the nine o'clock news looking for the child yeah. now it's daily posts on Twitter can people please reshare or retweet um, orange alerts are out for for children um, so in a roundabout way, I think it's important that people do go onto those websites and explore, you know, the, the vast numbers, because at one time in our not so distant past, the majority of missing children in Ireland were Chinese national girls. The last sightings were in Ireland, never again seen. And I suppose the same happened about 20 years ago with the numbers of asylum seeking children that were going missing and, and it transpired that Ireland was a drop off point. Um, um, for um, for the movement of children and Ireland intervened very effectively at that time. They closed down the hostels where those kids were being accommodated with limited supervision. Um, but what was startling at that time and what people were really appalled at, people, those of us working in the area, was that there wasn't a public outcry because our view was at that time, if they had been Irish children, there would have been. Whereas now, I think, um, you know, again, going back to the homeless situation, the pressure on services, all of these things, um, you know, things that we would have thought were unthinkable a few years ago are now being normalised. You know, and again, mm. thinking that, again, there's a peak in the number of asylum seekers living in tents on the side of the road. That is a massive risk factor. I never thought I'd see that in my lifetime. And I haven't been impressed with the way asylum seekers have been um, responded to in this country. But all of these things, as the threshold gets lower and lower and our acceptance gets higher, it just becomes normal um, and it's going under the radar. And I suppose, JP, you made the point previously that some of these reports um, and the, um, you know, like the report that's come from UCD and the statistics around missing people and the posts on social media, it is fantastic for drawing attention, but there's so much more goes under the radar. So, you know, we have these high profile pieces of information, but there is so much more going under the radar. And certainly for teens who are vulnerable, the, the risks on social media, you know, I've seen young people where they have been, um, you know, uh, somebody has contacted them, misrepresented their age, their, they're chatting to them as a peer, and then it transpires they're much older and the adults around understand uh, that, that this is definitely a, 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 an attempt to exploit for some reason, but the young person is locked into that relationship. And even though they know they've been lied to, they somehow accept the explanation and continue the contact because they're emotionally invested. You know, so social media, we have to be very vigilant about that as well, because I think there's so much that's happening under the radar that we're not, we're not picking up on in the same way as we are with yeah. the high profile cases. And we're talking about the going under the radar. We talked about the media and politically. You very you never hear politicians talking on the radio or in the door, apart from and I stand to be corrected, um into uh Peter Tabin. He's the only one who I've ever heard talk about child trafficking. And it was, as I said in my intro, it was I was absolutely flabbergasted that. When Leo Varadkar was asked in America, JP, you brought, alluded me to that, was asked in America, in the country that put Ireland on the watch list, that he said that he didn't think Ireland had a child trafficking problem. Mm -hmm. It's ludicrous that the Taoiseach of our, and Prime Minister of our country doesn't acknowledge we have a child tracking problem. The media are not reporting it, and politicians are not actually who are the legislators of our country and who can put in legislation for the protection of children and child trafficking and, and put in the criminal, bring prosecutions and criminal criminals, because it is it is an amazing amount of money that child trafficking is more lucrative than the, the drugs or the weapons trade industry. But in your view, and I, I know I sh maybe it's a wrong question to ask you, but I'm gonna ask it anyway, we can decide why is there no political goodwill in hi highlighting and floodlighting the child trafficking issue? And why are the media so silent? 
So I think, Rishim, you're you're very accurate in terms of speaking about Padre Tobin's um, was opening up of conversations at Doyle level. And um, we've been very fortunate with Padre's support over the past two years or so. I'm also very grateful to Maria Walsh, MEP, who yeah. has who has addressed the issue both here in Ireland and at EU Parliament level. Maria um, came actually flew into Ireland last December to co-host an event at the European Parliamentary offices on the issue of child trafficking. Um, so though she's new in the world of politics, she's really, mm -hmm. I guess, taking on the, the issue. And um, we also saw a very, I would say, astute um, exploration of the issue of trafficking a few years ago by Simon Coveney. Um, he wrote an outstanding piece in the press, almost predicting where the country would end up without, I suppose, fully addressing, or not by not addressing the issue of trafficking. Um, so there are a few, I guess, that have stood out from the crowd over the years. Um, why is it not being addressed? Because as Anne would always say, you know, once you start to unpick the issue, once you start to take the lid off it, then you're duty bound um, to respond to it. So I think it is a huge, huge, huge undertaking to, to look at it, um, but it's not a great undertaking to speak about it. Um, so we, we do regularly urge other members of political parties to, to take it on um, and to, to mm -hmm. I guess, open up the conversation as Padder, Maria and Simon have done so over the years. And I suppose it's worth mentioning that the Department of Justice has invested heavily in the youth diversion programmes and funds the research that comes out of UL around the Greentown study, which was a piece of research looking at the recruitment of children into criminal networks and the, you know all of the different factors that contribute to maybe the, the difficulties in young people extract, extracting themselves. So there has been investment in that aspect, but it's not named as trafficking. Um, you know, so uh, mm. it's as if also the different departments are doing their pieces separately mm. and there isn't a joined up thinking around it. And criminal activity of young people is exploitation, is trafficking, but those dots are not being joined up yet. So there's no definite, clear, concise clarity of the definition of from from legislation level within the government departments of the definition of child trafficking, uh, even prosecution, or even there from because I've never heard of and I could be wrong, even with the after aftercare of uh, a child going through who has lived that horrific, horrendous, heinous experience of being sexually exploited from how many times a day for these criminal gangs. Now, I suppose I do have to throw in a word of caution here in, in a sense, because I did work with TUSLA for five years, and I suppose I am also aware of some excellent work on the ground with vulnerable young people, and TUSLA would not be in a position to disclose that kind of information. Yeah. So I think we, we do have to balance that as well, because there is excellent work going on. Yeah. You, 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 you know, I wouldn't want to uh, diminish that either, but they're not in a, in a position to, to give uh, public um, information about that. I think but it's even also, that they can... sorry, Roshi, go ahead. I think something that your viewers and listeners might be interested in is a story that's available to download. Um, it's a podcast called The Witness in His Own Words. And it's the story of the first, the youngest ever um, individual to be placed into the Witness Protection Pro Program in Ireland. Um, and it's a story of a boy um, who was, got a, a part-time job as a 12 year old on the local milk round. Um, but he had been targeted and what ended up happening to him was quite terrific. He was trafficked not only for criminal exploitation, but also for sexual exploitation. Um, he was brutally abused and exploited over a number of years. And in the podcast, um, there's a series of ep episodes available to download. He speaks so articulately about his experience. And I think it gives it gives you a great insight into the level of control that his traffickers had over him, the level of fear that he experienced within that 
whole situation um, and I think it might be interesting um, for, for, for mm -hmm. your listeners to, to download. And Anne, and just, uh, you might, yeah. sorry, you might, you might be able to elaborate on this a bit more. What kind of things do they offer young people to kind of suck them in? Uh, yeah. uh, to you know, to kind of win, win, win their favor. Oh sure, look, it can be anything in terms of um, that grooming process. It can be anything from a happy meal at McDonald's to a new pair of runners to um you know a, a a branded hoodie or something it it doesn't have to be it could be a pack of cigarettes or a or a you know a bottle of beer um and it's just it starts off you know i suppose from the child's perspective quite innocently they're getting something in return for doing something and they don't maybe see any potential harm in that um so i think it 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 is very varied and also there's some information that that has come out through various different, you, you know, um, victim accounts uh, around the relationship initially being very positive and how, you know, when the emotional connection is formed, that then changes. So, you know, that young person goes in and gets a lot of affirmation, gets involved in a network, which could be for whatever reason. And initially it seems OK, like that, that the listening, that witness uh, podcast, it's it's very harrowing. But initially he genuinely thought he was doing he was on a milk round and he genuinely thought he had a part time job and he was helping his mom. You know, and it was only over time that it became apparent that there was something a lot more sinister going on. Um, and, 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 and then, of course, the dynamic changes. So I suppose, you know, again, it's preying on young people's vulnerabilities and going back to that UCD study they, they identified that there are groups of predators targeting young people's vulnerabilities. So they know very well what will appeal to the young person. So whether it's material things to keep up with their peers, it, it depends. It just depends. Mm. And there's also the children who are adopted, ab adopted and they are forced. They're not groomed. They don't they know exactly it's wrong and they have they have no way of escaping or getting out. I you talked about that podcast. I remember in 2010, the movie The Whistleblower, where the New York cop went over to Europe. That affected me for years afterwards, you know, and I still think about it, you know, but the things that we've done. And so it's actually, it's so that film, even in 2010, that was a real life story of, of real life. And with that New York cop, she couldn't go back to America. She's now living in the Netherlands. You know, so there's even that crucial issue of whistleblowers or anybody looking to going in and trying to help someone. That's not an easy job either. Um, someone trying to help. And I think, Roisin, it is important to point out the demand side um, as well, mm -hmm. because if there wasn't a demand for child victims of trafficking, we wouldn't have a problem in the first place. So with all of those children who were taxied around the country, mm -hmm. dropped off at hotels and B&Bs, there were individuals and groups of people waiting and ready to sexually exploit them. So, you know, that has to be addressed as well because uh, the demand, unfortunately, is very much there in this country. Like the perpetrators, the perversion of, of, of anyone who are knowingly going into a hotel room or anywhere to, to you know, sexually abuse or, or exploit a child or teenager. And also the people who are knowingly and willingly taxiing and transporting the children as well. People have to know that, that this is going on. People that, who are doing this, uh, you know what? They haven't got their head in the sand. They know exactly what they're doing. And otherwise they would be reporting it. Where we're supposed to be protecting our youth. We're supposed to be protecting the youth of, of, of our country and all over the world and nourishing them and, you know, letting them see what love is. Because that's, 
I just, I, you know, I'm, I'm just the more and more I think about it, that you know, the the people, it's a lucrative business, and people are getting paid to stay quiet. And that is that should that should be a criminal offence as well. And but again, prosecution that must be very difficult if um, because they have to get the evidence of the victims, don't they, before they can have a prosecution. Mm -hmm. They do, and I think that's one of the reasons why we're very much looking forward to the new NRM um, arriving. As I mentioned, that the the guards will be removed. Um, from that, I suppose, dual role of identification, victim support, not dual role, but identification, victim support, and investigation for prosecution. Um, because I think, you know, when we talk about victims of trafficking, we as, I guess, individuals, as organizations, and the state needs to be very clear here that when we talk about victim supports, they can't rely on, on a victim necessarily being involved in a prosecution. We're talking about trying to make people safe here. We're not putting extra, shouldn't be putting extra pressure or weight on victims, survivors of trafficking to lead for prosecutions on behalf of the state. Yeah. The state has already failed them by being victims of trafficking. Um, so there, there needs to be a very clear um, line in the sand, I think, drawn around that. Exactly, because you, when we think about the, a, a child and we're, we're talking, as you said, from 17 under, what would you say to young, any child under 17 under? And when you think that the, the, the age of consent is 17, and so, and, and the perpetrators are going for 17 and under, that they've been through enough horrific experience to have to go through another experience of uh, going through the the debriefing with police and and guards and social workers and and everything else that they should just be believed and then say yes because trained people they know when someone has gone through the the life experience of child um trafficking so they should be giving that space that time and that belief that they've lived that and be, then the healing process should be automatically just put into place for them. Where do you see, uh, finally, I will ask each of you, where do you see this going forward now within the next six months to a year with child trafficking here in Ireland? Maybe I'll kick off if that's okay, Bernie and Anne. Um, I think Bernie touched on something um, very important when she spoke about, you know, the, the staff that are there on the front line. And I feel very heartened to be engaged with Tusla. Um, and to be engaged with their staff. You know, we can see an agency from outside and we can point at it and we can blame it. But when you get in through the door and you meet the individuals that, that get in there every day and are doing the best that they can do for children, um, it's, it's heartening to see. So I think we're at a point in Ireland in time where the issue of child trafficking has landed in very significant places. We mightn't all be talking about it every day online, but it's with people who can can affect change. Um, so the next six months, I see um, a new landscape emerging um, for victim identification, victim aftercare, and victim supports. I'm very very heartened to to be at this point in time. I suppose Rasheen and Paul, seven and a half years down the line, um, it's great to see it finally come to fruition. And also, it's, it's um, you know I'm I'm not against. Tusla at all because you know they are only working with the resources that they are given. Absolutely Roisin and I'll be very honest I was quite um, I guess challenged by Tusla um, for many many years working different roles but I have to say when we began working so closely with them I, I, I've been inspired by a number of people working there just about their commitment and their dedication and like many of us do, working the eight, nine, ten o'clock at night to make change for one child. So there, yeah. there are tremendous people out and about as well. Definitely, and they're there, and they're doing that job and still in that job because they care. Absolutely, you know, and it's the resources that needs to be put into Chisler and the finances and the funding and the training, as you said. So Anne, mm -hmm. and then we'll come to you, Bernie. <laughs> and where do you see from your perspective? Well, I hope 
that the scoping research project that was published by UCT is a, is a starting point. I think we have to be mindful that this was a very, a, a relatively small um, research project which looked specifically at children in care. Um, and so with the alarming findings that, they, that transpired in that particular piece of research documenting children 12, 13 and 14 um, suffering unspeakable exploitation. I would like to see this being a launch pad for more research being done in other um, areas throughout the country because really we are only just scratching the surface and only really seeing the tip of the iceberg of something that is um, so prevalent and is really an, you know the dark underbelly of our society. And Bernie. I suppose uh, for me, obviously, I agree with the uh, two previous comments, but I think that national reporting mechanism, if that is implemented well and it is embedded from departmental level down, it's clear and people can engage with it because I suppose what we can see on the ground is that for frontline staff working in communities, there's a level of frustration when they report their concerns and nothing happens. So if that system is more robust and there are appropriate responses, trafficking is named and um, it's adequately resourced, I think that will make a huge difference. And um, so I'm really looking forward to the changes that are going to come on foot of the, uh, the legislation. And do you envisage maybe come back when September arrives and all the politicians are back in the doyle that they will be talking about it in Leinster House? We'll have to send them a copy of your podcast, Roshi, and we hope that they will be. <laughs> Well, I, I've actually contacted a lot of politicians and said that, you know, I sent them a little uh, text message this week and said, in September, I, I want, I'm talking about A, B and C and child trafficking. So uh, right. they've actually, two of them, uh, three of them have said that they will, they will come on and talk about it. So maybe we'll get you, the three of you back on for that as well. Um, right. Because... I've, you know, I grew up with it, I suppose, because we lived in Africa and Saudi Arabia, so I was always aware of the signs, and I was actually only thinking this morning, gosh, my parents, I used to get on the aeroplane from Saudi Arabia at 12 years of age, go to Paris and come to Dublin, and I'm thinking, I wasn't dead for that with my child, but I, it was safe, and the, the guys in Dublin Airport, they all knew me because I was doing it so often, but at 12 years of age, it was safer back then, or was it? But it seems to be more prevalent now, doesn't it? Than of is it is child trafficking more prevalent now and more than what it was years ago, or just different? Maybe more visible and connected worlds, Roisin, um, have yeah. afforded us the, the opportunity to learn about what's going on in other places um, and what's going on here at home joining the dots um well, and so that, I think that's why yeah. it's I think why we're so grateful to have been on your podcast this evening just to to be able to share that message outwards um across yeah. social media as well so thanks Roisin it's much yeah. appreciated will you give us maybe send me the link uh JP and I'll put it in, in the description box below to any of the links that the three of you think might be um important to anybody listening to this because you don't know you might even see a, a child or mother or someone who wants to help and maybe uh, how you, we can navigate them to you where you can navigate them to the, where the people they best uh, go to but um paul any last comments from you yeah roshan as, as i said at the, at the top of the program that i was kind of kind of blow kind of blown away by the subject and tonight has really, really opened my eyes even more to the scale and the different forms that uh, trial traffic can, uh, can can appear in. But the most startling startling statistic that that um, I think Anne mentioned it uh, in the last uh, over a, was a three or four year period, there mm. were only five children officially identified yeah. as traffic and only one prosecution today. Two. So that, two, two. That's absolutely mind boggling, and this. Definitely is a subject that needs to be highlighted uh, much more and, 
and please God, the new legislation coming forward will make it make a huge difference and um, I suppose it's great great to see the work you're doing in MECPATS as well about giving the frontline yeah. uh, workers the tools to, mm. to see these signs and you know really um, intervene at, a, at an early stage. And it's great that, that Bernie is so active in this within the community in Kerry and, and beyond and coming on the, the panel tonight because we really do appreciate that. As you said, we need to get it down to grassroots level in the communities, in every community and frontline workers as well. Yeah, and I think Bernie made a good point as well that it's not just an urban issue, it, it it's, has an impact right across, across the country. Absolutely. Well... JP O'Sullivan and Anne and Bernie Smith, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us tonight on the Irish Political Roundup. Thank, thank you. Both. Thank you. Very welcome. Thank you. Lovely to meet you.